Are you filled with feelings of self-doubt? Do you find yourself prone to minimizing massive dilemmas? Or for allowing the smallest problems to get blown completely out of proportion? At the Pierce Institute, our patent-pending Somnoscope technology provides safe and effective dream therapy while you rest in the comfort of our flagship clinic. Located right next to the secondary overflow parking lot at the University Medical Center. Somnoscope will make your dreams come true. This is Superliminal, developed and published by Pillow Castle Games. So Superliminal is like a first-person uh, puzzle game, similar enough to something like Portal in that there's rooms and rooms of distinct puzzles, but the puzzle mechanic for Superliminal, as you can probably tell from the video footage, is sort of adapting your point of view and like fourth perspective. So you could pick up a cube that looks like it's like really small, but if you position yourself in such a way that you're looking at a far wall or something like that, and then let go of the cube, it will kind of scale up to be enormous. Uh, and then you can like keep futzing about with that until you get it to be the correct size you want it to be and stuff like that. Doing it a bit of a disservice just by talking about it because you know, it's much easier to see what I'm talking about by just looking at the video footage. There are additional puzzles like uh, Tronf Le Cie, which is like a 2D image that's displayed across like architecture, but you can look at it from a particular angle and it will appear to be a 3D image. So something like uh, you might see like a street artist like draw this kind of impressive image on the ground and it looks like nothing from a particular angle. But if you stand in a particular spot, you'll see, oh, it's like a Looks like there's a hole in the ground. And then you walk past without giving him any money because you're a dick. Story-wise, Superliminal is uh, pretty basic. You are in a kind of dream state. You've gone through this sort of dream therapy thing. And they're trying to work through your problems, I guess, something like that by f solving puzzles. I don't know, it doesn't make too much sense. But uh, you get lost at some point and you end up in like various levels of dreams on top of dreams and things like that. And the chorus is to sort of just keep going and you'll find your way out. You'll wake up eventually. Things get trippier as, as it goes on, the puzzles get a bit more varied, a bit more interesting. It's really fun uh, kind of puzzle solution and like just, just forced perspective in general is really interesting and I would actually be really interested to know how like mechanically they make it work just from a computer science background. I'd just be interested to see how they did that because it's really clever and really interesting to me. Puzzles themselves aren't super difficult once you understand the basic premise of how the game works. They're easy enough to solve. I think just actually mechanically seeing things behave in ways that you're not used to in a video game are just really interesting. The game uh, doesn't take itself too seriously. It's a bit tongue in cheek, again, like, like Portal, like Stanley Parable, like it's kind of the characters that talk to you uh, during the game are like funny and like easygoing. It's like, it's, it's a lot of fun to just uh, listen to their um, their updates on your status and stuff like that is really funny. I'm really enjoying Superliminal and I'm getting a lot of fun out of just the, the general trippiness of the gameplay. Superliminal is, came out on PC last year, late last year, and is now available on PC, PS4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch. Give it a look if you're interested. Hello, my name is Dr. Glenn Pierce. In the event that this elevator does not wake you up, please don't interact with anything that strikes you as psychologically significant, as we will no longer have any way of controlling it. For example, if you see your parents, please punch them in the face as hard as you can and immediately run away. This 
This is The Takeover, developed by Pelican 13 and published by Dangan Entertainment. The Takeover is kind of a throwback to the 90s brawler beat-em-ups like Streets of Rage or Final Fight or Double Dragon or something like that. Takeover storyline is pretty basic. You are a collection of beat-em-up guys and girls whose stepdaughter is kidnapped at the beginning of the game and you go on a quest to uh, locate her and there is much punching and kicking and shooting and such. There's not a, to be honest, there's not a whole lot to say about the takeover. It does what it sets out to do, like it is a throwback to the 90s games. There's punching and there's kicking and there's walking to the right and sometimes up and down. There's special moves that eat your health but do a lot of damage or clear out the room. There's a special attack that can clear the screen for you when you've built up a meter or there's an additional rage meter that makes your attacks more damaging and you're temporarily invulnerable. Characters also have a weapon on them at all times that you can kind of take out if you're in a particularly nasty situation or something like that. Um, there's only footage here of the main character, but there are um, three other characters, one you have to unlock later on. And they play kind of to the to the stereotypes, like you've got your all-arounder, Ethan here, and then you've got Megan, who's uh, faster but not as powerful, and Connor, who is a lot more powerful but not as fast, and then secret fourth character that I won't spoil if you do decide to get into the game. The takeover overall is fine, it doesn't do anything bad, it doesn't do anything necessarily novel. Um, it's one like, like the one downside to it is that Streets of Rage 4 is right there and kind of just feels a lot more polished. Um, and I know that like Pelican 13 is like one guy, I think, <laughs> as far as I know, developing this, so that's fair enough. He's like, he's getting a lot done with just one person. The environments are really, really nice. The game is fluid. There's a couple of hitches every now and then, but that's fine. Like, there's juggling, there's like, uh, animations to play between punches and kicks as separate buttons so you can kind of make some fairly fluid combos, juggles and throws and such like it like it plays well it's just not doing anything particularly new I guess like if you hadn't played a beat em up before or a brawler beat em up before yes this would be like a good one to, to play but if you played any of the other ones or have Streets of Rage 4 that like there's nothing really I can recommend here one thing it does have over Streets of Rage 4 that I will give it is there is variation in the levels Streets of Rage 4 is like just brawler levels it's just beating stuff up which fair enough that's what the game's about but at least here it breaks it up a little bit in that you've got um, kind of timed levels or you've got car chases or there's a bit later on where you're in a fighter jet and stuff like that. Like it does break it up so there's there's more to it than just walking right and punching dudes. I did like the takeover but once it's like Streets of Rage 4 only came out fairly recently and there's like the, the comparison is right there. I personally feel Streets of Rage 4 is the better game. But um, check it out for yourself. It is not a full price title. I think it was only like 20 euro or 20 of your currency, I suppose. Takeover is available on PC and Nintendo Switch. Let's get going. We've wasted enough time as it is. Yeah, the faster we get to cracking heads, the better. <laughs> yeah. They're coming. This is Ghost of Tsushima, developed by Sucker Punch and published by Sony Interactive Entertainment. Ghost of Tsushima is a open world action adventure game. Um, if you've played any of the recent Assassin's Creeds, so Odyssey or Origins, um, you'll have a fair idea of how this game plays. You take on the role of Jin Sakai, who's a young samurai lord. And at the beginning of the game, yourself, a number of other samurai, and your uncle, who's like head samurai of the island or something, of the island of Tsushima, uh, are attempting to repel a Mongol invasion, but it doesn't go well, and you're pretty much the last remaining samurai. The goal then for the rest of the game is to sort of get the Mongols out of the island. Um, and story-wise, Jin is sort of battling with the idea that he can't really repel them by the normal means. There's no samurai army 
and standing up to them as, as the regular samurai tactics is just not working because they're so inflexible. So he has to kind of battle with the idea of taking the less honorable route of guerrilla warfare and sort of proto ninjutsu. And it doesn't sit well with him and it doesn't sit well with other samurai, but like the commoners like it, but then they get a different idea that maybe they don't need the samurai. So yeah, there's a kind of, a bit like a class structure thing going on, but at the same time, there's the inner turmoil of, you know, if you spend too much time fighting monsters, you'll become the monster. Or if you, or if you prefer, die the hero or live long enough to become the villain. There's that kind of thing going on. Gameplay wise, you're just taken about the island of Tsushima, performing different quests for different people, uh, trying to build up this kind of posse of people who can help you first rescue your uncle who was captured during the initial battle, and then later on helping to build up a bigger army to sort of repel the Mongol invasion. And you do that by just like killing, <laughs> killing lots of Mongols more or less. Um, so there's a heavy emphasis on combat in the game. There's two like different distinct pillars, I guess, if you like. There's the samurai way, where it's, you just stand there and, and fight and use like your combat abilities to take on a lot of enemies. And there's the kind of shinobi or shadow way of doing things, which is like, you know, underhanded backstabs, stealth takedowns, poison, bombs, that sort of thing. Again, still like very Assassin's Creedy. Creedy, I guess? Sure in that you could fight openly, but you could also just blow them all up with a bomb and you get more or less the same effect. Anyway, additionally, uh, Ghost of Shima is a beautiful game. It's like gorgeous looking, very minimal hood. So again, the game kind of has this additional thing where if you need somewhere to go, you can kind of pick a point on the map, but then there's no UI to sort of tell you where to go. You just use the wind. The wind kind of guides you, so you just sort of follow the wind and it will take you where you need to go. And the closer you get there, like nature will sort of help you out. So it would be like a golden bird will take you the rest of the way for like finer locating. Or um, there's some situations where a fox will pop out of a, a fox den and they'll lead you to a secret and that kind of thing. So it's really like immersing you in the world. So you're not using a hood weird map marker that I guess would not exist in, in you know, Tsushima at the time, so there's that. Combat is a lot of fun, uh, very fluid, pretty difficult at the beginning because you have very limited options, but eventually you will uh, gain new abilities, um, you'll gain new stances from um, observing the Mongols and how they fight, you'll develop a new stance to, to tackle how they fight, so initially you'll be good at fighting swordsmen because you're samurai, so you fought swordsmen before, you know how that works. But then you'll have spearmen, so you'll have to get better at fighting spearmen, shield guys, uh, big brutes and stuff like that. So you've got different stances that you can swap between to better combat them. One thing I would have liked to have seen from that is that it's a bit like matching the enemy. So I'm in this stance, he has a sword out, so I'll use the sword stance. He has a spear, I'll use the spear stance. He has a whatever, a shield, I'll use the shield stance, etc. It would have been nice if they had a bit more blend or a bit more interplay between them like a stance is good against two or three or something like that building a con something like what neo does neo also has stance switching and is a samurai game but they're not so restrictive like you don't use one stance against a particular enemy or another stance against whatever you just use the stance that you want to use that you think best fits the situation so rather than matching them to enemies it might have been better to match them to a strategy that you were going for um, the Witcher actually also does that in that it has a stance for crowds, it has a stance for bigger enemies and stuff like that. So there's some, there's some mix and match here. The game world itself is quite uh, big. It's a bit, it's story gated, at, it's story gated from the outset so you don't have access to the entire island but um, as the story progresses more of the island opens up to you. There are different side quests or side events if you like. Some of them uh, just sort of flesh out the gameplay a bit more, so some of them are combat focused, some of them are stealth focused, some of them just show off uh, like parts of Japanese culture really, some of them are like sit in an onsen and your health will increase, or um, create a haiku and you'll get like a new headband or a new hat or something like that. Again, clothing, like, there's a huge variety of different clothing options that you can pick up in the game. Tons and tons of different armor pieces and different headbands and hats and, and skins for your sword and stuff like that. All of it in-game, 
nothing to worry about uh, microtransaction wise or anything like that. It's all collectible in inside the game. Like Spider-Man, actually, those costumes, same deal. Another side activity uh, is dueling. So dueling is like just one-on-one -on -one fights, usually with a boss character. They're a bit more involved in the combat. They're not quite as easy to sort of brute force your way through with different abilities. Uh, they're a lot of fun. They're probably my favorite part of the game, just the, the dueling aspect to it. I really, really liked Ghost of Tsushima. I spent a lot of time with it, ended up platinuming it. It's a really good game. Some things I would have liked to see different. Again, what I said about the combat, just make it a bit more fluid. Again, kind of match strategy rather than matching opponents. It just feels like I use this for this guy, this for that guy. It's, it's a bit too simple, uh, in my opinion. And there's one sort of technical issue in that Switching stances could be more fluid. Neo is very quick to change stance, whereas Ghost of Tsushima, I find that Jin has to be doing literally nothing for you to switch stance. So if you're in the middle of, of performing an action and you want to change stance so that the next action you do is in the stance you want, sometimes it drops the input and you just it doesn't happen. Either it just ignores it or, or something like that, I'm not sure. Bit annoying, it doesn't happen all the time and it's easy enough to recover from it, but you know, it's there, I notice it, it happens more than once. Really impressed with what I saw of Ghost of Tsushima, um, I'm hoping there'll be a sequel, but I don't know how they'll do it, because the story wraps itself up pretty well. Maybe they'll just take what they've learned here and apply it to a different period of Japan or wherever they decide to go, I don't know. That being said, Sucker Punch also work on Infamous, and I would really like another Infamous too, so if you could do that, that'd be great. Anyway, Ghost of Tsushima is a PS4 exclusive, so check it out if you're interested. This is Other Side, developed by Lightbulb Crew and published by Focus Home Interactive. Other Side is an isometric uh, turn-based strategy game similar to something like XCOM. In Other Side, you are like the general of the Red Mother's army of daughters. So the story and game mechanics are sort of interwoven. So at the beginning of the game, the Red Mother is this kind of immortal entity that is holding back the tide of the other that is beyond the veil and is threatening to enter our realm or something. Um, and they enter the realm through a chosen one of suffering. So it's like a person in history who has suffered uniquely and the other can use them to break the veil or something. And the mother character has been um, sort of stopping that from happening throughout history, but she misses one or she fails in one of them. And that's sort of the start of the game. There's this sort of pause in time where you take over as this general and you use the mother's uh, recollections or memories of previous battles to form daughters, which are your soldiers for the game. So there's a lot of like convoluted um, psyche and uh, metaphysics going on in the story that sort of we weave their way into the gameplay. But essentially you have an army, I mean not to say an army exactly because you never really have a lot of people. Um, but you have like this collection of soldiers, daughters, that can be broken up into different classes. So you've got like a melee focus sword fighter, you've got a range focus gunslinger, you've got a def defense or tank or aggro control shield bearer kind of thing. They're the only three classes I've seen so far and they're the only ones I've seen in the artwork that I've seen around of the game. So I'm kind of thinking that's all there is, which is somewhat disappointing. I think they could have done with like one more, I don't know, support character or something. Anyway, but you feel these characters off against monstrous entities of the other that is like using them to sortie into our world, kind of fight them off and hold back the tide. So it's very like level focused, like XCOM, you go off with your limited team, with limited resources, and do your best against an overwhelming army uh, in a level-based structure. So like levels can just be kill everybody or escort this important NPC or survive until 
you know, an extraction point is available, etc. There's lots of different things. The game itself revolves around a fairly small loop in that you have a number of days to defeat a boss. Chances are you are not going to beat them the first time around, so you will fail, but you can bring resources over into the next go. You have another loop where you can try again and again and again, and eventually you'll have enough resources that you can bulk up your soldiers to the point where you will beat the boss, and then you can move on to the next one, and the cycle more or less repeats itself. The next boss will be more difficult and so on. Resource management for the, the daughters is kind of interesting. So you can't, uh, you can't heal anybody in between fights. You can't heal anybody at all, actually. Uh, the only way to get them or to rejuvenate them is to sacrifice another soldier of equal or better worth. So you're always kind of up against it in that, do I have enough health? Would they survive? Mm, these are kind of good. I kind of want to hang on to them. So who do I kill? To, uh, now what do I do? Additionally, you can assign pickups or like boosts. They're called memories in games, like a memory triggers, but you can assign them to a character so you can bulk up their stats in that way. But if they die, you lose it. So it's like, do I want to do I want to give them this? But they're probably going to die, so maybe I should hang on to it. But then they'll die if I don't give it to them, etc. There's a lot of always being somewhat up against it all the time, which reminds me a lot of um, Darkest Dungeon because that has a similar kind of vibe, even though you can heal people in between in Darkest Dungeon. But it does have the kind of idea that you're going to fail. You're going to fail a lot, but you'll get better next time and next time and next time. Uh, it does have a difference in XCOM in that XCOM you sort of flounder for a very long time in XCOM and then inevitably fail um, unless you're playing, unless your save's going. Whereas in other side, you don't flounder very long. Like you fail like pretty fast. It's only seven days, seven fights, assuming you even make it that far. Um, and it's pretty quick to just restart the cycle. And you can restart the cycle whenever you want. Uh, I mean, you have to pay resources to do it other than just dying, but I mean, you can restart whenever you like. So it has got a bit of like a rogue light element to it and that you can carry things across into your next cycle, which is definitely helpful. I will have uh, another video on other side where I just play through a cycle for you guys to have a look at. It might be out already, I'm not sure. I forget what, what order I did these in, but um, you'll have a, a better look at like the actual mechanics. There's some interesting like initiative order they have going on, uh, turn order where you can perform more actions in one turn but your next turn will be a lot later in the cycle or something like that so like it's like there's some really interesting stuff going on here i do worry that there's going to be a heavy either grind or difficulty spike later on that might throw me off it and the fact that you get the three classes right off the bat but don't get any new ones by the looks of us a bit concerning we'll see how they go like i have in no way plumbed the depths of these classes or anything like that still very surface level where i'm at at the moment i haven't beaten the first boss let's put it that way but yeah you can have a look at that video uh if you're interested in other side other side is currently available on uh, pc ps4 and xbox one and i think switch i'm not too sure about switch check it out if you like Those were some of the games I played for June and July of 2020. Big standout for me was Ghost of Tsushima. I just had tons of fun playing that. Uh, really, really enjoyed the combat and exploring the world and just getting lost in Tsushima for like a month <laughs> or so. I can forget how long I actually was playing it. Other side also looking really interesting. I'm not very far in, but I am digging the art style and the general theme uh, and narrative that the story is playing with so i'm hoping to see some better stuff out of that super liminal is super trippy and i am very much enjoying that but i have a feeling that i'm very close to the end of it so i don't know we'll see how that goes and the takeover is serviceable um i like the music and i like the kind of fluid combat but it doesn't really do enough 
to kind of elevate it for me. But let me know what you thought about it uh, in the comments or on Twitter or whatever. Um, next month, so August, even though it's currently almost the end of August when I'm recording this, but anyway, whatever, 2020, it's, shit's happening. Anyway, next month we'll be looking at mostly indie games because there's nothing big um, out that I have any real interest in. So some of the smaller games we can look at. Um, we're looking at Spirit Fairer, which is a kind of chill game where you ferry like dead spirits to the afterlife but you have to get them like ready to go and it's kind of chill and wholesome despite it being about death we'll see we'll see looking at mortal shell which is like the opposite <laughs> this is like somewhat like a souls like game where you inhabit bodies of fallen heroes or warriors or whatever um and do souls things you know deliberate animated combat and things like that we'll see Inmost is a 2D horror game from Chucklefish, and that's all I know about it, so we'll see <laughs> We'll see about that. I've heard good things, but I literally know nothing about the game, so we'll see how that goes. Then we've got Raji, an ancient epic, which is a, a 2D side-scrolling action game with a kind of Indian folklore um, aesthetic, so looks good, and I always like, like side-scrolling action stuff. It's kind of my deal, so hopefully that will be interesting too bit out of the loop to be honest on games so we'll see how these guys turn out so bundling june and july together mostly because i spent the majority of june doing nothing and there weren't that many games out anyway so yeah i kind of just lumped them together so there you go double whammy even though it's not double the content but whatever 2020 everybody loves it also on the channel, there are some longer um, playthroughs of these games. So TakeOver has a full playthrough. No commentary because I actually wasn't planning on doing a full playthrough. I was just getting footage for this video, but there you go. Um, I don't think at the moment they're not up yet, but there will be um, some playthroughs of Other Side and Superliminal. Um, not Ghost of Tsushima because I've had my fill of that game right now. Anyway, let me know what you think. Again, sorry for the pause in content, hoping to get back to more of it. Let me know what you think in the comments and I'll see you guys next time.